The one inch thick indictment was handed up at 2.25 this afternoon before federal magistrate Charlene Sorrentino. It took less than two minutes to complete the procedure. At this point, the large indictment is sealed, meaning we don't know for sure who has been indicted. But we have learned who some of the major subjects of the investigation have been and what the investigators believe they have found out about waterfront corruption. The massive probe of waterfront corruption began three years ago at the port of Miami. Investigators say they have found evidence of widespread payoffs, organized crime infiltration, threats, and large-scale union corruption. Apparently, this corruption is a way of life on the East and Gulf Coast waterfronts, with Miami's being one of the worst. According to my sources, at least seven local union officials were subjects of the investigation. Several have major arrest records. Most of them come from Longshoreman's Checkers Local 1922, which has offices at the Miami port. One of the principal targets is George Barone, president of Local 1922. In 1954, Barone was charged with felonious assault, but pleaded guilty to a lesser charge. However, in the early 1960s, he left the New York docks after the Waterfront Commission conducted a corruption investigation. Two of Barone's associates in a union there were convicted felons, and together they all moved to Local 1922 in Miami. Another major target is William Boyle, one of the local's vice presidents. In early May, a former shipping official testified in court he made payoffs to Boyle. In 1934, Boyle was convicted of larceny and in 1942 of smuggling liquor into the U.S. Both Boyle and Barone, aside from being local officers, are also vice presidents in the ILA's international structure. The investigators have also targeted local 1922 office manager James Vanderweide who in 1942 was sentenced up to five years in prison on a homicide conviction, and who in 1944 was sentenced from five to 10 years for robbery and larceny. Vanderweide's son, Cornelius, was also investigated. Sources say he is the local's assistant office manager. The last major officer from local 1922 to come under scrutiny is Vice President Douglas Rago. Rago was once sentenced to prison in New Jersey for assault and robbery convictions and has an arrest record dating back to 1941. The investigators in the grand jury have also looked into Miami's largest longshoreman's local, number 1416. In the early morning hours, hundreds of members line the sidewalks outside the union's hall, waiting for jobs handling port cargo. The president of local 1416 since the mid-1960s is Cleveland Turner. Sources say he has also been a major target of the waterfront probe. The Miami Grand Jury also investigated the ILA's national leadership, targeting union organizer Fred Field, Jr., who works out of Miami Local 1922. Field is the third or fourth most powerful man in the entire union. He is currently appealing a conviction in New York on charges he extorted money from a company in exchange for a promise of labor peace. The investigation of waterfront corruption not only concentrated on union officials, but also moved into private industry on the port. We have learned that in Miami, at least six major firms were investigated. In the containerized cargo field, investigators looked into the Florida Welding Service Corporation and United Container and Ship Repair. Among the stevedores, they investigated Harrington and & Company and Marine Terminals Incorporated. And in the shipping industry, they concentrated on the Chester Blackburn and Rotor Company and on Eagle Incorporated. One investigator says that corruption is so widespread that many shippers simply consider union payoffs to be part of the cost of doing business on the waterfront. The indictments will not be made public until arrests are made, but we have learned from sources that the charges filed will include extortion, racketeering, labor law violations, and tax law violations. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News, at the Federal Courthouse. Today's indictments culminate almost three years of work by federal investigators, and they are expected to have a significant impact on some of the nation's major port operations. Ralph Page looks at the cause and effect. This investigation is the largest of its kind in the nation's history, and it's far from over. It should last several years and branch out into union pension funds and possibly the buying and selling of political influence. Massive amounts of federal manpower has been applied with as many as 250 investigators focusing on a port and upwards of 1,000 throughout the nation. The investigation began here in Miami and it quickly moved to most of the major ports on the Gulf and Eastern Seaboard. The target was the same, the workings of the International Longshoremen's Union and payoffs as a way of life. 
The technique used to secure payoffs is a kind of extortion since non-payment means the agent or shipper is driven out of business. The overriding factor, investigators say, is the union's absolute control of the docks. They dictate who works, when they work, and how they work. Without the union, cargo does not move. The methods of intimidation under these circumstances are unlimited. Shipping agents who are not in the union's favor may not be able to get a crew for several days while still paying almost $1,000 a day dockage fees. A work gang may be sent. However, a lot of movement may result in very little accomplished. An accident may occur, damaging cargo or the agent's equipment. Discounting sinister acts, one investigator said, if the union made you take every man the contract called for, every time you need a crew, you could not stay in business. There is no such thing as free enterprise on the docks. Infiltrating the docks closed society has been all but impossible until now. In this case, federal investigators were led into the inner circle by a member of that circle. They were introduced as relatives or employees of a man who worked the Miami waterfront for 30 years and made substantial payoffs to the union himself. The investigators carried body bugs, allowing them to tape high-level meetings. Sources close to the investigation said they witnessed payoffs and heard and recorded conversations which outlined tactics to bring individuals and companies into line. Over 350 court-authorized wire interceptions were amassed. Thousands of documents were compiled. The investigators are confident of the results. They say this is the strongest case ever put together in the labor racketeering area. Their optimism is bolstered by several guilty pleas already accepted in spin-off cases. The investigation centers around these payments which have become a cost of doing business. Millions of dollars that eventually come out of the consumer's pocket. The target companies run the gamut from the large worldwide connected Harrington and Company to small service type companies like Florida Welding Services and United Container and Ship Repair. Not only union officials targeted are familiar to investigators. Listed as officers of United Container are Joseph and Sebastian Catrone. Sebastian and daughter Laura had their New York waterfront license revoked when the Waterfront Commission found they had converted one quarter of a million dollars of company money to their own use. The center of the snowball is one man. He had all it takes to expose the inner workings of the docks closed society and expose the inner workings he did. A look at Joey Teitelbaum tomorrow. Ralph Page, Channel 7 News. The first arrest was made at 5.15 this morning. Agents picked up George Barone, president of Miami Checkers Local 1922. Barone was arrested in connection with a probe of waterfront corruption that began three years ago at the Port of Miami and then spread to ports from New York to Houston. Sources close to the probe tell Channel 7 News they have found evidence of widespread corruption, threats, and payoffs on the waterfront. Also arrested in this morning's sweep is Cornelius Vanderweide, assistant office manager of Local 1922, and Oscar Morales of the Florida Welding Service Corporation. When the arrests are completed, the union officials and shippers will be taken to the Miami Federal Courthouse for a hearing. At that point, the extent of the large indictment will be made public. Sources tell Channel 7 News that about 15 local people have been indicted. We're also told that arrests are being made in other cities in connection with the waterfront probe. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News at the Miami FBI office. One of the first arrested this morning is George Barone, president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1922. He was arrested at his plush Coral Gables residence by the FBI and the Public Safety Department. Barone was seized in a pre-dawn sweep that netted 13 people, either local union officials, businessmen, or their employees on the waterfront. Also arrested was James Vanderweide, local 1922 office manager, a convicted felon. His son, Cornelius, an assistant office manager for the local, was also arrested. The arrest followed a three-year investigation of waterfront corruption that started in Miami and spread to ports from New York to Houston. Indictments in the case were handed down yesterday, naming 22 defendants, most of them from the Miami area. Sources close to the probe say they have found evidence of widespread payoffs from businessmen to union officials. One of the main charges being leveled is racketeering. After all the arrests were made, the defendants were taken from the FBI office to the Miami Federal Courthouse for a bond hearing. Among those taken in handcuffs was Jeremy Chester, president of the Chester Blackburn and Rotor Stevedoring Company. Also arrested was Joseph Catron from the United Container and Ship Repair Company. 
Catron's two sisters and his father were also indicted in the probe that concentrated as much on businessmen as it did on union officials. Of the six local union officials named in the indictment, three were arrested in Miami and two were arrested out of town. Those out of town are ILA general organizer Fred Field Jr., arrested in New York, and 1416 local president Cleveland Turner, arrested in Atlanta. William Boyle, local 1922 secretary treasurer, was also indicted, but is still being sought. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News, at the federal courthouse. In the early morning hours, federal agents and detectives from the Public Safety Department slipped quietly from the Miami FBI office, preparing for a pre-dawn arrest sweep that netted 13 of 22 defendants in the Longshoreman indictment. Among the first arrested at 5 o'clock this morning was George Barone, president of Miami Longshoreman's Local 1922. Barone was arrested at his plush apartment hotel residence in Coral Gables. After being awakened by law enforcers, he was searched, handcuffed, and driven to the FBI headquarters. He is charged in the indictment with racketeering, conspiracy, labor law violations, filing false tax returns, and extortion. Also arrested was James Vanderweide, local 1922's office manager, a convicted felon. He too faces charges of racketeering, conspiracy, and extortion. Vanderweide's son, Cornelius, the local's assistant office manager, was arrested on the same charges as his father. The arrests follow a three-year investigation of waterfront corruption that started in Miami and spread to East and Gulf Coast ports from New York to Houston. Indictments in the case were handed down yesterday. Investigators claim to have found evidence of widespread payoffs from businessmen to union officials. They also say they have found evidence of extortion, threats, and intimidation on the docks for at least the past dozen years. After the arrests were completed, the defendants were taken from the FBI office to the Miami Federal Courthouse for a bond hearing. Most of the defendants are businessmen. Among those taken in handcuffs was Jeremy Chester, an officer of Chester, Blackburn, and Rotor, and Marine Terminals Incorporated, two stevedoring companies. He is charged with racketeering. Also charged was Joseph Catrone, the president and director of the United Container and Ship Repair Company. Two of Catrone's sisters and his father, Sebastian, were also indicted. Max Foreman, a certified public accountant, was named in the indictment, as was Oscar Morales, the vice president and director of the Florida Welding Services Corporation. All total, 12 company employees or officials were targeted in an investigation that concentrated as much on businessmen as it did on union officials. Of the six local longshoremen officials indicted, two were arrested out of town. ILA general organizer Fred Field Jr. was arrested in New York, where he had just been jailed after losing an appeal on a separate conviction. Local 1416 President Cleveland Turner was arrested in Atlanta. Local 1922 Secretary Treasurer William Boyle surrendered this afternoon to U.S. Marshals in Miami. He is charged with 36 separate counts in the indictment. After the bond hearing in federal court, the defendants were all released on personal surety bonds. Jeremy Chester, with his attorneys Richard Gerstein and Murray Sams, would not comment. Neither would James Vanderweide. Several of the people indicted are union leaders from other cities, including Jacksonville, Mobile, Alabama, and Charleston, South Carolina. So far, only one of the 22 indicted yesterday remains to be arrested. Federal officials investigating the ports hope this indictment, plus one expected months later in New York, will begin turning the tide on waterfront corruption, which one source describes as rampant. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. Forty-six-year-old Joey Teitelbaum grew up on the Miami waterfront. He knows the docks from the ground up and knows all the skeletons and all the closets. The union hierarchy accepted him as a friend, so when he introduced a relative or employee, there was no question. The relatives or employees in this case were federal agents. What they heard and were able to tape led to indictments all over the country and 17 U.S. Marshals to keep Joey Teitelbaum alive. Joey Teitelbaum goes to work every day doing what he knows best, moving cargo. As he moves in, around, and under the heavy cargo, federal prosecutors review the hundreds of tapes and thousands of documents gathered because of him. He had led them from port to port, city to city, taking them into meetings so they could tape and witness payoffs. At one point, five federal investigators were in his employ, 
and he even carried tape recorders into high-level union meetings himself. He moves about his business seemingly unconcerned. He knows there have been threats on his life. Recently, Vincent Insulo, a New York-based informant, talked openly about his minor role in this investigation. He was killed, shot twice in the head. The marshals worry they go where he goes, at work or at a quiet seaside retreat to look at a possible new boat. For 28 months, Joey Teitelbaum's family didn't know what he was doing. At the beginning, the family saw some new friends. They were from the Dade County Public Safety Department's Organized Crime Bureau. When the case moved to other parts of the country, the friends were federal investigators. Teitelbaum met the OCB officers when they convicted him of a misdemeanor charge. He had talked to an informant about committing a murder. Was this the motivation? The investigators denied this, pointing out that no misdemeanor carries a death sentence, but because of his help in this case, the danger of death is very real. His friends hastened to add that 10 years ago, Teitelbaum went to federal and state authorities about corruption on the docks, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. Joey Teitelbaum has been under 24-hour guard for several months. We have just learned from the Justice Department that they are now re-evaluating his protection with an eye toward reduction. Their reason, according to sources, is cost. This will not come as a surprise to some of Joey Teitelbaum's family. They expressed to me uh, several months ago that as soon as the indictments did come down, that the protection would be taken away. Vic? Ralph, this man obviously is under a lot of pressure. What's his, what's his bottom line motivation for doing this? He seems to have taken this case personally. It's become his. Uh, he got involved in the investigation. He, he led investigators through it, sometimes by the hand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would say to him that you should quit, go into an undercover program. He refused. He developed his own leads at times. And he really took it very personally and was determined, and is determined, to see it through. Teitelbaum went to work with a full complement of marshals, and it was obvious that the extension of his protection was a relief. The strain that was visible last week when he was notified his protection would be removed or reduced is gone, and the old determination in both expression and walk has returned. Attention now seems to be in the political area, as speculation abounds concerning Senate hearings and what Teitelbaum may contribute to that part of the investigation. Sources have indicated that political influence peddling is an integral part of the corruption on the docks, and a spokesman for Senator Lawton Child said today, the Senate Subcommittee on Investigations will conduct hearings in Florida this summer. But, he said, the focus will be on organized crime in general. Teitelbaum, meanwhile, continues his daily routine. He works at the shipping company where he is cargo manager. He is continually interrupted by phone calls, both from U.S. attorneys preparing the massive case and reporters attempting to tell his story. He is watched constantly by the marshals, as is his major concern, home and family. Teitelbaum is a bit more secure today, feeling confident that he will not be left out in the cold and that he will be consulted prior to any change in his securities makeup. He emphasized that Miami is his home and here he will stay. Ralph Page, Channel 7 News. Nineteen of the 22 people indicted in the case showed up this morning either in person or through their attorneys. Sixteen of them entered pleas of innocent. Businessman Sebastian Catron, however, shown here, was told that because he and his son Joseph didn't have a lawyer yet, they would have to come back. And Cleveland Turner, the president of Miami's Longshoreman Local 1416, came to court, only to find that he was scheduled for next week. Turner was arrested in Atlanta and is charged with racketeering, conspiracy, and labor law violations. Pitting innocent was James Vanderweide, office manager of Miami's Longshoreman Local 1922. He is charged with racketeering, conspiracy, labor law violations, and extortion. The indictments followed a three-year investigation of waterfront corruption and union payoffs. The case began in Miami and is considered the biggest investigation in the history of the Justice Department, which is headed by Attorney General Griffin Bell. An irony in the case is that one of the defendants is represented by Griffin Bell's son, defense attorney Griffin Bell, Jr. The younger Bell says there's no conflict in his defending someone in this case and says he's not worried about the appearance of any conflict. No, appearances only apply when a, someone's trying to get a job in Washington. But I think the constitutional rights of a criminal defendant to be represented by whomever he pleases uh, is far more important than the appearance. Ironically, Bell Jr. says he's going to write to the Justice Department, headed by his father, to complain about the way his client was arrested by federal agents. He said they treated him like a common criminal. He also says he's going to ask the Justice Department to pay his client for coming to Miami. 
Bell represents Eliza Jackson, the president of the Longshoremen's Local in Savannah, Georgia. Jackson pleaded innocent to the various charges against him. After the arraignments were over, defendant Max Foreman ran to his car to avoid photographers. He is a certified public accountant, charged with racketeering, labor law violations, and making false reports to union trust funds. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. Fifty-three-year-old Reuben is charged with three others in an alleged scheme to steal about five and a half million dollars from four union trust funds. The money was supposed to have been used for worker health, welfare, and pension plans. Reuben was indicted yesterday in Phoenix, Arizona, and was arrested at his Miami Beach home. He was released from jail on bond and today appeared in Miami federal court. This is not the first time Reuben has been in trouble over the misuse of union money. In 1975, he was convicted of 103 counts of embezzlement, income tax evasion, and racketeering, and was sentenced to five years in prison. But he's currently out on appeal. Reuben used to be the head of South Florida's biggest labor organization, the Southeast Florida Laborers District Council. The new indictment charges that he used his union position to make money from Florida pension and trust funds available to the other defendants. Among other things, the indictment says the defendants offered bribes and kickbacks to union officials in order to receive union insurance business. It also says they used 11 different companies as fronts to hide the complicated scheme. The indictment also says the defendants paid a so-called finder's fee of a quarter million dollars to former U.S. Attorney General Richard Kleindienst. He was allegedly paid to help win a $24 million contract from the Teamsters Union. Kleindienst was supposed to help influence union president Frank Fitzsimmons to award the contract to one of the front companies. Neither Fitzsimmons nor Kleindienst were indicted. If Reuben is convicted for his role in the alleged scheme, he could be sentenced to a maximum 60 years in prison and fined $70,000 trial is set for October in Phoenix. Reuben will have a hearing later in Miami to determine if he will go to Arizona voluntarily to face the charges. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. The Teamsters, the nation's biggest labor union, also reputed to be one of the most corrupt. With numerous ties to organized crime, it is suspected that over the years, much of the union's giant pension funds have been funneled into mob-controlled activities. The Teamsters' ties to crime came to light vividly last week, when one of its influential leaders was sentenced to life in prison. Anthony Provenzano of Hallandale was convicted of killing a union leader. Police say the man known as Tony Pro is highly placed in organized crime. The Teamsters' union has two million members, ranging from truckers to policemen to office workers. The union is run by a national organization with headquarters in Washington, D.C. The national union is then broken down into five regional conferences. One of them is the Southern Conference of Teamsters, which covers a nine-state area from Florida to Texas. Other states included are Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. The Southern Conference headquarters are located in Hallandale on the ninth floor of this building. Their decisions are made that affect 52 union locals and about 130,000 workers. The Southern Conference collects dues, oversees strikes, and runs its own pension plan for union officers. From sources and documents, Channel 7 News has learned the conference is now under investigation by the Labor Department and the U.S. Organized Crime Strike Force for possible criminal activities within it. With this subpoena, the government is trying to seize the union's financial records from 1974 to the present. In a sworn affidavit filed at the federal courthouse, the head of the Miami Strike Force says the investigation is of several possible crimes. They include embezzlement from union assets and from an employee benefit plan, racketeering, conspiracy, kickbacks, improper records keeping, and receiving payments, gifts, or loans from employers of union workers. The director of the Southern Conference is this man, Joseph Morgan. He is also a vice president and general organizer in the big national union. Morgan would not talk to us on film, but did speak to us off camera at the conference headquarters. When asked if he knew who the target of the investigation is, he said he had not been told, but assumed it is Joe Morgan. The Labor Department is already suing Morgan in Chicago 
for his role as a former trustee of the union's scandal-ridden Central States Pension Fund. Morgan and 16 others resigned from the fund under government pressure after it was alleged they were making questionable loans. In a civil suit, they are now being asked to repay over a million dollars from their own pockets to cover losses. Although the investigation of the Southern Conference is just now beginning, it is already at a standstill. The Teamsters have asked a Miami federal judge to quash the subpoena and end the investigation. They say the Justice Department is illegally using a grand jury to obtain evidence for what the Teamsters claim is nothing more than a civil investigation. The Justice Department, however, says it is most definitely a criminal investigation. Spokesmen for the Southern Conference claim they have nothing to hide and say they would allow the Justice Department to look at their records if only it would promise not to take all the records away. They say the investigators can work in this room and take any documents they need as long as copies are made. However, a government source claims it would be hard to study the records under these conditions, with Teamster officials looking over their shoulders and studying whatever records they made copies of. At this point, an investigation is underway, but basically it's only on paper yet. Because the Southern Conference of Teamsters is fighting the Justice Department subpoena, nothing much is being done. All the two sides can do now is wait for a ruling from the federal court. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. A condominium and a private plane are some of the things federal people will be looking into in their investigation of the Southern Conference of Teamsters. And Channel 7 News has learned the investigation began when some union members began complaining. Mark Potter has the second of a two-part investigative report on the Teamsters probe. The Southern Conference of Teamsters, representing 52 union locals and about 130,000 workers in a nine-state area from Florida to Texas. The Southern Conference is a regional division of the Teamsters International Union, which is based in Washington, D.C. The Southern Conference headquarters are located in Hellendale, on the ninth floor of this building. Channel 7 News has learned the conference is now under investigation by the Labor Department and the U.S. Organized Crime Strike Force. Records in the federal courthouse show the investigation is of several possible crimes. They include embezzlement from union assets and from an employee benefit plan, racketeering, conspiracy, and kickbacks. Sources tell us the investigation began not in the Justice or the Labor Departments, but instead on the grassroots level in Dallas, Texas. There are some members of a reform group within the Teamsters and some other individuals, including a former Teamster official, began complaining about what they thought was excessive spending on the part of the Southern Conference leadership. Eventually, they wrote letters to President Carter and to the Labor Department. And from there, the investigation began. The dissident Teamster members got their information by studying union financial report forms that, by law, must be filed publicly with the Labor Department every year. In the report for 1974, they found that instead of giving a gold watch at retirement time, the Southern Conference leaders gave a furnished condominium valued at over $45,000 to a retiring top union official. The condominium is number 718 in this building, the Cannon Gate Condominium Apartments in North Dade. Records at the Dade County Courthouse show the condominium gift was made in appreciation of the official service to the conference and to the working man. The records also show the retiring official, Murray Miller, sold the condominium a month later. The financial report forms also show that other union officials were given automobiles upon their retirements. Cars were also given to the widow of an official and to a conference secretary upon her retirement. The union men also made note of the conference purchase in 1975 of a $2.4 million jet airplane. A pilot and co-pilot, as well as a chauffeur, are also on the conference payroll. They also noted the conference ran up some other expenses. In 1975, it spent over $248,000 for what the conference labeled airplane, travel, hotels, entertainment, and dinner. This on top of the jet airplane purchase. In 1976, Airplane, travel, hotels, entertainment, and dinner cost $178,000. Convention expenses were nearly $38,000. The director of the Southern Conference is Joseph Morgan. 
He is also a vice president and general organizer in the big national union. Members studying the records wondered why, in 1975, Morgan made a $50,000 loan to the Southern Conference itself. He was repaid that same year. At this point, the Justice Department is trying to subpoena the conference records from 1974 to the present. However, their efforts are being resisted in the courts by the Teamsters, who say the Justice Department is acting illegally by using a grand jury to gain information for what the Teamsters claim is nothing more than a civil investigation. Morgan is already being sued by the Labor Department in Chicago for his role as a former trustee of the union's troubled Central States Pension Fund. The criminal investigation of the Southern Conference is just now beginning, but because of court action, it is basically at a standstill at this point. But Channel 7 News has learned that if and when the investigation gets underway, it will first concentrate on the questions raised by the union men themselves. A source says investigators will try to find out who authorized the gifts and the spending, and for what reason. In the case of the airplane, they'll try to find whether it is being used only for official union purposes. Statements made on Capitol Hill show the investigation of the Southern Conference is not the only investigation in South Florida of the Teamsters. Earlier this month, Acting Assistant Attorney General John Keeney testified that grand juries in Florida and other states are investigating uses of the union's giant Central States Pension Fund. Sources also say the Labor Department is conducting a separate Teamsters-related civil investigation here. While the truckers who pay the union dues continue to roll, the Teamster officials in South Florida who spend their money are coming under closer scrutiny by the federal government. And in the case of the Southern Conference, it was the union members who got the investigation started. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. The government's waterfront corruption case has been called the biggest in Justice Department history. It accuses waterfront businessmen and officials of the International Longshoremen's Association with offenses including racketeering, extortion, and labor law violations. The indictment was returned by a Miami federal grand jury last June after a three-year investigation of the nation's east and Gulf Coast waterfronts. Now two of the businessmen indicted have pleaded guilty. The first is Alvin P. Chester, the chairman of the board of the Chester Blackburn and Rotor Steamship Agency. He confessed to making payments to the president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1922 in exchange for a promise of labor peace on the docks. This is Union President George Barone, the man Chester said he made payments to. Barone was among the union officials indicted and arrested. Chester said he made two payments of $750 to Barone and ordered another man to make payments totaling $80,000 from 1967 to 1977. The second businessman to plead guilty is Jeremy Chester, an official of Chester Blackburn and Rotor. He confessed to discussing the two $750 payments with Alvin Chester. The two men are not related. This is the second time the Miami Federal Courthouse has been the scene of confessions against officials of Longshoremen's Local 1922. Last August, the president of a transport company pleaded guilty to charges he made payoffs to this man, William Boyle, secretary-treasurer of the local. Because of their pleas, the Chesters were each sentenced to a year's probation. Alvin Chester was also fined $30,000. Jeremy Chester was fined $17,500. Theirs are the first guilty pleas to be entered in this massive waterfront corruption case, and the pleas were handled very quietly by the government. The other defendants are expected to go to trial at the end of this month. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. In June of last year, an indictment was handed down by a Miami federal grand jury. It charged waterfront businessmen and Longshoremen's Union officials with trying to control the waterfront through a pattern of racketeering. The government says it found evidence of payoffs, kickbacks, extortion, threats, and intimidation. Twenty-two were indicted. 
the bulk of their alleged activities took place at the port of Miami. Today, two of those defendants pleaded guilty to a charge of conspiracy. They are Laura Catron in the dark pantsuit and her sister Francesca Catron. In exchange for their pleas, the rest of the charges against them will be dropped. The Catrones are employers with the United Container and Ship Repair Company of Miami. They run the outfit with their father, Sebastian Catron, and their brother, Joseph Catron, both of whom were also indicted in the corruption case. In court today, the Catron women admitted that they made illegal payments to this man, George Barone, the president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1922 and a major defendant in the corruption case. The Catron said that for over a year and a half, they paid Barone $1,500 a month. This is the second time such an admission has been made in court. At the beginning of this month, two other waterfront businessmen said they made payments to Barone in exchange for labor peace on the docks. Francesca and Laura Catron also admitted they made false statements on reports for employee welfare and pension plans. They will be sentenced Monday. The maximum they could receive is a five-year prison term and a $10,000 fine. However, two others who pleaded guilty in the case were not given jail time. The widespread investigation into waterfront corruption is continuing, even in Miami, where the first indictments were handed down. Earlier this week, in New York, top Longshoreman's official Anthony Scotto was indicted on racketeering charges. Shown here at contract talks in Miami a year and a half ago, Scotto has been identified in Senate testimony as a mafia captain. The waterfront corruption case is expected to go to trial a week from Monday. Witnesses will include undercover FBI agents who infiltrated the docks in order to learn of the corruption firsthand. Today's guilty pleas mean that 18 of the 22 defendants are still scheduled to go to trial. The case is so complex that it is estimated that four to six months will be needed to complete the trial. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News at the Federal Courthouse. Next Monday, trial begins in the biggest labor corruption case in U.S. history. Waterfront businessmen and officials of the Longshoremen's Union will be arriving at the federal courthouse. Mark Potter reports on who the defendants are and how the case was started. The investigation leading up to the trial has been dubbed UNIRAC, which stands for Union Racketeering. For three years, FBI agents worked undercover at waterfronts on the East and Gulf Coast, witnessing, recording, and taking part in payoffs from businessmen to officials of the International Longshoremen's Association. What they found has been described as an attempt to corruptly control the nation's ports through payoffs, extortion, threats, and the buying and selling of work contracts. The FBI says this racketeering cost hundreds of millions of dollars, raised the price of American goods and port services, and led to their economic non-competitiveness. On Monday, trial for 18 of the defendants begins in Miami, where the investigation started. Most of those on trial come from this area, but some will be arriving from Jacksonville, Charleston, South Carolina, Mobile, Alabama, and Savannah, Georgia. There will be an interesting cast of characters. One of the defendants is a former March of Dimes poster boy. Others are top union officials. Among those officials is George Barone, president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1922. Already four waterfront businessmen have pleaded guilty and admitted they made payoffs to Barone. Also on trial is Cleveland Turner, president of Miami's other Longshoremen's Local, number 1416. Part of his defense will be paid from funds raised in a tribute to Turner held last summer, after he was indicted. Turner was honored at the Delito Hotel for his dedication to the community. The honorary chairman of the fest was Miami Mayor Maurice Ferre. I, I believe that uh, Cleve Turner is a good man. Another top union official is Fred Field, Jr., the ILA's general organizer. He will be coming to trial under guard because he is serving a federal prison term in Danbury, Connecticut. Also under guard, but for his own protection, is Joey Teitelbaum, the government's top witness in the case. The investigation began in 1975 after Teitelbaum allowed FBI agents to infiltrate his shipping firm undercover. Last June, the FBI investigated a report someone offered to pay a crane operator to drop a cargo container on Teitelbaum's head. There were no arrests. Even this week, Teitelbaum keeps working on the docks, although he is always shadowed by police and U.S. Marshals. An ironic twist to this trial is that one of the defense attorneys is Griffin Bell, Jr., the son of the U.S. Attorney General. The Justice Department, headed by Griffin Bell, Sr., claims UNIRAC is its biggest labor investigation ever. 
Both say there is no conflict of interest, despite their father-son relationship. The trial is expected to last anywhere from three to six months. In fact, jury selection itself may be lengthy because of the number of lawyers and issues involved. Over 400 potential jurors have been called, which may be the most ever in Miami federal court history. Even when the trial is over, the investigation of waterfront corruption will continue. One source says it could take years because waterfront corruption is so widespread. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News, at the federal courthouse. Good evening. A waterfront corruption trial that could last anywhere from three to six months started in Miami today. There are numerous defendants. The Justice Department says the trial is the result of the biggest labor corruption investigation in U.S. history. The defendants include some of the biggest names in the International Longshoremen's Association. They are accused of trying to illegally control East and Gulf Coast waterfronts through payoffs, kickbacks, threats, and the buying and selling of work contracts. Among the defendants are the presidents of two Miami Longshoremen's locals, George Barone of Local 1922 and Cleveland Turner of Local 1416. Other Miami officials on trial include William Boyle, local 1922 secretary treasurer and office employee Cornelius Vanderweide. The reason there are so many local officials is that the corruption investigation began at the port of Miami. With the help of this man, waterfront businessman Joy Teitelbaum, FBI agents went undercover and for three years claimed to have witnessed, recorded and took part in payoffs. Teitelbaum is being protected by U.S. Marshals and will be one of the government's top witnesses. In time, the investigation spread to other ports on the East and Gulf Coast, and some of the defendants in Miami now are from out of town. Among them are Ison Clemen, a Longshoreman's International Vice President from Mobile, Alabama, and Eliza Jackson, Longshoreman's local president in Savannah, Georgia. Jackson's attorney is Griffin Bell, Jr., the son of the U.S. Attorney General. Today, Bell tried to have a gag order imposed on press coverage of the trial, but federal judge William Hoover denied the request and also refused to move the trial out of town. Instead, he began the long process of jury selection. Defense attorneys wanted the trial moved because they say there has been prejudicial pretrial publicity in Miami. The trial not only concerns union officials, but also waterfront businessmen who allegedly made payoffs to the union officials. Included are Sebastian Catrone and his son Joseph Catrone, both from Miami's United Container and Ship Repair Company. Two other members of the Catrone family have pleaded guilty to charges they made payoffs to Miami Longshoreman President George Barone. One of the defendants came to trial today in handcuffs. He is Fred Field Jr. from Miami. Field is a top union organizer who is serving a federal prison term in Connecticut. About 20 minutes ago, one of the waterfront businessmen indicted in this case changed his plea to guilty to a charge of conspiracy. He is Vincent Fiore, a Miami trucking executive. His guilty plea means that five defendants in this case have pleaded guilty now, leaving 16 to go to trial. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News at the federal courthouse. Down here in Dade County, three more guilty pleas entered today in the Miami Waterfront Corruption Trial. Eight of the original defendants have now pleaded guilty. Thirteen are to stand trial. The government calls this the biggest labor corruption case ever. Among the defendants to enter guilty pleas are Joseph Catron and his father Sebastian Catron, both Miami Waterfront businessmen. They each pleaded guilty to a charge of conspiracy and admitted they were involved in racketeering by making illegal payoffs and kickbacks. They also were involved in the corrupt buying and selling of work contracts. The attorney for Joseph Catron is Stanley Bartell. He says the reason they entered the guilty plea is the Catrones could not afford to sit through a six-month trial. He also said the Catrones were forced to make payoffs to Longshoreman's Union officials and, in that sense, were victims. They were faced with the decision as to whether or not to continue in business or to do what they were told to do. And uh, that's part of the viciousness of this type of activity. What would have happened had they not made the payoffs? They'd have gone bankrupt and would have had to have gone out of business. Their entire investment and their blood and sweat and tears in putting their business together would have been down the drain. The other plea today was entered by Robert Bateman, the first Longshoreman's Union official to plead guilty in the case. He is the president of the ILA local in Charleston, South Carolina. Bateman confessed to receiving payoffs, including one for $4,000 paid out by an undercover FBI agent. Bateman and the Catrons will be sentenced later and could be fined and ordered to prison. The waterfront corruption trial is the result of a three-year investigation that started at the Port of Miami and spread to other ports on the east and Gulf Coast. 
Among the defendants are some of the nation's top Longshoremen's Union officials, including the presidents of the two Miami ILA locals. They are George Barone of Local 1922 and Cleveland Turner of Local 1416. The trial will get underway as soon as jury selection is completed. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. The defendants in the case were accused of taking part in a scheme to illegally control the waterfront through payoffs, kickbacks, threats, and extortion involving union officials and businessmen. The investigation began in Miami and spread to other Atlantic and Gulf ports. Among those on trial are nine members of the International Longshoremen's Association, including this man, James Vanderweide, office manager of Miami's Longshoremen's Local 1922. Also on trial are the presidents of Miami's two Longshoremen's Locals, Cleveland Turner of Local 1416 and George Barone of Local 1922. Although the majority of the businessmen indicted in the case have pleaded guilty, four still remain on trial. Among them, Neil Harrington, one of Miami's most prominent shippers. One of the defendants is now in the hospital. Fred Field, Jr., a top Longshoremen's Union official, is in the Miami Heart Institute. He is currently serving a one-year federal prison term, but Judge Hoobler has asked the Bureau of Prisons to release Field for the duration of the trial so he can take care of his failing health. The trial is being held on the second floor of the federal courthouse. Ironically, the mural beneath the entrance to the courtroom is of a longshoreman. At this point, the trial is still at the jury selection stage, and it will continue tomorrow. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News, at the federal courthouse. Connie, they have some problems at a Miami trial. It involves security. The government is trying to protect its chief witness in the waterfront corruption trial, and the defense has objected. The security is being planned for Joey Teitelbaum, who will be one of the first government witnesses to testify in the waterfront corruption trial. Three years ago, he allowed FBI agents to infiltrate his shipping company and begin the biggest labor investigation in U.S. history. Although Teitelbaum is still working on the docks, he is under 24-hour guard by police and U.S. Marshals. When he testifies, a metal detector will be set up outside the courtroom. It was installed today but was dismantled after defense attorneys complained it might prejudice potential jurors. Judge William Hoovler said the security procedures still need to be worked out, but most likely will be in effect when Teitelbaum and perhaps another protected witness appear in court. The defendants in the case are accused of taking part in a scheme to illegally control the waterfront through payoffs, kickbacks, threats, and extortion involving union officials and businessmen. The investigation began in Miami and spread to other Atlantic and Gulf ports. One of the defendants is now in the hospital. Fred Field, Jr., a top Longshoremen's Union official, is in the Miami Heart Institute. He is currently serving a one-year federal prison term, but Judge Hoobler has asked the Bureau of Prisons to release Field for the duration of the trial so he can take care of his failing health. The trial is being held on the second floor of the federal courthouse. Ironically, the mural beneath the entrance to the courtroom is of a longshoreman. An odd development temporarily halted today's waterfront corruption trial in Miami. It involved a woman who was somehow appointed to the jury, even though she can barely read and write English. Early this morning, Prosecutor John Evans arrived at the federal courthouse, ready to make an opening statement to the jury. This would mark the beginning of a possible six-month trial involving corruption at the Port of Miami and other waterfronts. The defense attorneys also were ready. The jurors had all been selected, and the much-heralded trial was ready to begin. But then, a surprise. Judge William Hoover announced that he was afraid one of the jurors could not sufficiently understand the English language, obviously a critical point. The juror was Mrs. Oilda Machado, described by the judge as honest and sincere. She was put on the jury after questioning by the judge and the attorneys. It took complaints by other jurors to bring her language troubles to light. And even though Judge Hoovler finally expressed concern for her ability to understand the issues discussed, some of the lawyers still fought to keep her on the jury. The issue was finally resolved when Judge Hoovler asked Mrs. Machado to fill out a questionnaire. She couldn't do it. And since the law requires a juror to at least be able to read and write the English language, she was thanked for her time and was dismissed from the jury. Judge Hoovler said if her inability to handle the language had been discovered at the end of the trial, months of work would have gone down the drain. With Mrs. Machado out, a replacement had to be found. So jury selection started once again, and it took all day. Barring any further surprises, 
Opening statements now start Monday, and the evidence begins to unfold from there. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. At the opening of the Miami Waterfront corruption trial, government prosecutors detailed an alleged 12-year payoff scheme. And the government says the enterprise was started by the Longshoremen's Union officials at the Port of Miami. In statements to the jury, Prosecutor John Evans said that by 1975, the Port of Miami was full of corruption in the form of illegal payoffs, kickbacks, threats, and the selling and buying of work contracts. He also said in that year, the corruption began to spread from Miami to four other southeastern ports, Jacksonville, Charleston, South Carolina, Mobile, Alabama, and Savannah, Georgia. Evans described four Miami Longshoremen's Union officials as being, in his words, charter members of the 12-year scheme. They are George Barone, president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1922, Cleveland Turner, president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1416, William Boyle, secretary treasurer of Local 1922, and James Vanderwide, 1922 office manager. Nine other defendants are alleged to have joined the scheme later on. In the opening statements today, the importance of government witness Joey Teitelbaum came to light. Time after time, it was alleged that he took part in payoff schemes while working undercover for the FBI. Teitelbaum is scheduled to begin telling his story to the jury tomorrow, and tight security to assure his safety will be in effect. During opening statements by defense attorney Jose Martinez, a potential problem crept up. Martinez said he agreed. Payoffs were a way of life on the waterfront which is what the government says. He also said his client, Miami shipper Neil Harrington, would blame some of his co-defendants for his troubles. That means at some point, Judge William Hoover will have to decide if a separate trial is warranted. It is possible there will be several Miami waterfront corruption trials. From the federal courthouse, Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. Connie, there was tight security day today at the waterfront corruption trial. There was all to protect one man. Security was set for the arrival of the government's star witness in the trial. Joey Teitelbaum took the stand telling of payoffs to top Miami Longshoremen's union officials. Teitelbaum was escorted to the Miami Federal Courthouse by U.S. Marshals. He is the government's top witness in this trial and is being given 24-hour protection. Over three years ago, the 46-year-old shipping company executive began cooperating with federal authorities and allowed FBI agents to infiltrate his company. Together, they documented an alleged scheme by Longshoremen's Union officials and waterfront businessmen to illegally control port activities through payoffs and threats. In a hearing today to determine what evidence will be given to the jury later on, Teitelbaum told of the payoffs he made. Payoffs, he said, that made his life so much easier at the Port of Miami. In one instance, he said, he was told by George Barone, president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1922, that in exchange for a work contract, he would have to pay $5,000 cash. However, he said that even though he paid the money, the contract went to another shipping company. Teitelbaum also told of paying thousands of dollars to William Boyle, secretary treasurer of Longshoremen's Local 1922. Some of the payments were made in the form of free cruise tickets. Two of them, he said, would eventually end up in the hands of the son and daughter-in-law of then Jacksonville Mayor Hans Tanzler. Teitelbaum also said he paid $50 a week to Cleveland Turner, president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1416. He said this was an exchange for a reduction in the amount of money Teitelbaum would pay in labor charges at his company. And in a statement that summarizes his testimony, Teitelbaum said he was told by Longshoremen's office manager James Vanderweide, we are going to control the port. The special hearing will last another day or two. At one point during the hearing today, Teitelbaum asked if he could take a break because he said he was nervous. That feeling may hit him again when the defense attorneys begin to attack his credibility. The fact that Teitelbaum agreed to cooperate with authorities after being arrested on a murder solicitation charge may give the defense attorneys much to work with. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News, at the federal courthouse. Tape recordings of alleged payoffs to Miami Longshoremen's Union official were played today in the waterfront corruption trial. The government's star witness, Joey Teitelbaum, told of making payoffs at the Port of Miami to get a shipping contract in Georgia. The Port of Miami, where corruption is a way of life. That observation was first made by investigators looking into the situation. Now the allegation is being made in a Miami federal courtroom. The look at port corruption is being offered by Joey Teitelbaum, 
the government's main witness in the trial of 13 union officials and waterfront businessmen. While running a shipping company, Teitelbaum worked undercover for the FBI, secretly tape recording alleged payoffs to officials of the International Longshoremen's Association. He is now under protection by U.S. Marshals. This is George Barone, president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1922. With him, William Boyle, secretary treasurer of the local. Teitelbaum testified that both men told him that if he wanted a shipping contract in Savannah, Georgia, he would have to pay them $15,000 in cash for the favor and a percentage of the cargo fees. Some of the payments were made here at the home of the ILA headquarters at the Port of Miami. Teitelbaum testified that Boyle was paid in this bathroom, down the hall from the ILA office. Teitelbaum was wearing a hidden tape recorder. And in court today, he was heard making payments in what he said were $1,500 increments, paid out in $100 bills. Teitelbaum also said in order to get the Savannah contract, he had to pay this man, the Reverend Eliza Jackson, president of the Savannah Longshoremen's Local. And for labor peace in Miami, he said he had to pay off Cleveland Turner, president of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1416. In 1976, Teitelbaum said he attended a meeting with union officials at the Port of Miami and was told to remove his shoes. The reason he was told was that an employee at the Dade Public Safety Department had tipped a waterfront businessman that an investigation was underway and that someone was taping conversations. Teitelbaum's tape recorder, located in his shoe, was not detected. Teitelbaum's testimony has not yet been heard by the jury. It is being offered at a hearing outside the jury's presence to determine what parts of the evidence are admissible in court. The special hearing is expected to last through next week. Mark Potter for Channel 7 News. Former Jacksonville Mayor Hans Tanzler testified in the Miami waterfront corruption trial today. His name had come up in connection with cruise tickets allegedly provided by waterfront businessmen under orders from a Miami Longshoremen's Union official. The former Jacksonville mayor and unsuccessful gubernatorial candidate was asked about cruise tickets he gave to his son as a wedding present. In testimony earlier this week, shipping executive Joey Teitelbaum said he paid for the tickets that ended up in Tanzler's hands. Teitelbaum said he did so on orders from William Boyle, secretary treasurer of Miami Longshoremen's Local 1922. Teitelbaum then testified the tickets were given to Jacksonville Longshoremen's Union President Landon Williams, who gave them to Tanzler while he was still mayor. Today, Tanzler said he did nothing wrong because he paid for the tickets. Me? What did I do wrong? I bought two tickets. I bought my son, son a wedding present. If that's wrong, then I, you know, so be it. What's, what's, what have I done wrong? I hadn't done anything wrong if he gave me the tickets. Tanzler says he does not know what Landon Williams did with the money. Teitelbaum says he was never paid back. The testimony comes in the trial of 13 Longshoremen's Union officials and businessmen charged with waterfront corruption. In today's testimony, Teitelbaum said he had to pay over $10,000 to local union officials for the privilege of doing work in Mobile, Alabama. Yesterday, he told of a $15,000 fee for work in Savannah, Georgia. Thousands of payoff dollars, Teitelbaum said, went to Longshoreman Boyle, who at one point allegedly became upset because Teitelbaum's payments were not being made on time. Teitelbaum says he received a threat from Boyle. Allegedly, it went like this. Outside the union office at the Port of Miami, Boyle told him a man named Kaminsky had just been killed. Teitelbaum asked, what was that supposed to mean? Boyle held out his hands and shrugged, then said he wanted Teitelbaum to work with shipper Neil Harrington. Teitelbaum had opposed the idea. Boyle then said local union president George Barone was attending Kaminsky's funeral. Teitelbaum asked if this was the Roaring Twenties, where you kill someone, then send him flowers. Boyle then said all the tensions would be relieved if Teitelbaum would give him some more money. The trial is not only bringing out allegations of corruption, but also some of the color of the waterfront. For example, Union President George Barone is called Twinkle Toes. There is a man named Mutsy and another called the Little Guy. Union organizer Fred Field Jr. is referred to as both the Fat Man and as an angel of death who won't pay for cruise tickets. And there are secret bathroom payoffs and fingers allegedly rubbed together to indicate that more payoffs are due. Mark Potter, Channel 7 News at the Federal Courthouse.